Uh, my name is Anthony Eden. Uh, I'm one of the founders of DN Simple. The other is Darren Eden, my brother, who's down here today as well. Uh, and today I want to talk to you a bit about using Erlang for authoritative DNS. So a little bit of background first. What is authoritative DNS? Essentially, whenever you have a domain on the internet, somebody has to ultimately have authority to tell the rest of the world where that domain resolves to. All right? And so authoritative DNS is all about being the authoritative provider of that DNS data. Uh, another piece is resolvers. So those are the, the recursors that go out and actually try to determine who the authority is and then return data from the authority. Um, so a bit of background. At DN Simple, we've been running PowerDNS, which is an open source C++ DNS server, a fantastic DNS server, for three years now. And we still have it running in production on, on our unicast network. Um, it's a fantastic server that can hook up to a backend database, in our case, uh, MySQL. And, and then we also run Postgres as well for our production database. We sync the two up for this particular case. But it's really fantastic that you can put in these backends to it that are custom. And for some of the things that we do, like our alias record, uh, we needed that functionality. And we actually did the first implementations in Ruby, which is kind of insane. Uh, be, but it works because it, it works off the idea of, of a simple POSIX pipe where it can have an, a coprocess that runs in memory and it can just pass data in, pass the questions in and get responses back. Um, there came a point though where it started to be a performance issue. Essentially the, the Ruby processes were using lots of resources. The, it was consuming lots of time uh, to start giving back responses and we were essentially being limited with uh, what we could do with the throughput that we could do. Um, so the first thing I started playing around with when we realized that we wanted to sort of see if we could advance our DNS resolution was keeping PowerDNS but swapping out the backend implementation. So in one case we, might, we tried the idea of having a closure app that, that would be running separately and that there would be inter-process communication. That, that didn't work too well. Uh, we also tried out the Lua backend for PowerDNS. So Lua seems like a really great solution because as in, as in sort of an in-process language, it's really fast, it's good as a control language. So we thought, okay, this will be the optimum solution. It turned out that s some of the things that we need to do, such as DNS resolution from inside of our authoritative name servers, ended up being difficult. So difficult, in, in, in fact, that it, it was just became a nightmare. So this was, around, this was sometime around summer last year, middle of summer, it was like July, I think. And um, I started thinking about, well, I had failed a couple times at learning Erlang, so I wonder if I could do this again. I had programmed a little bit of closure. I would started to get the, the notion of functional programming in my head, so I wonder if Erlang would be an interesting language to build an authoritative DNS server in. Now, if any of you have ever tried to build an authoritative DNS server, they're actually, they look, they're like deceptively simple, all right? That's the beauty of them. Anybody can write an authoritative DNS server. And then once you try, you realize that no one should ever be writing an authoritative DNS server. It's a mistake. It's not the simple respond to a question that's the hard part. It's all the edge cases that come from a protocol that's been around for 25, 30 years. Right? But I have a lot of time on my hands. I have, you know, I have four kids, so like I've got all this extra time. right? So I'm like, OK, I'll use this as a platform to learning a language. Um, I said, well, why Erlang? Okay, obviously it's parallel processing. It's known for the ability to have lots of processes that, that can run independently. It's known as a, a, a functional language without data sharing, so like in, basically immutable data. I thought, okay, this seems like a really interesting thing to do. Uh, so I started playing around with it. The first iteration was just sort of learning a little bit how Erlang worked and how, how we could do this, how we could use it for an authoritative data server. And in the process, I started understanding the benefits of Erlang. And I realized this, this was not only a good solution in this case, it was exactly the right solution that we needed to eventually have. And so I, I, I want to just show a few, I'm going to show three of the benefits that have come up uh, that I've found as I've been working with Erlang in the, con in the context of an authoritative DNS server. And I'm going to give you some code examples as well along the way. So the first one, and I think this was a key one that sort of pushed me over on the side, was the, the binary bit syntax inside of Erlang. And you'll understand why in a second. Basically, this is a way of representing binary data where you can deconstruct a stream of binary data into internal structures very easily. Okay? So let's take a quick look at this bit of code right here. So this is the function definition for decoding a DNS message. 
Um, and if you, start, if you look at basically how it decodes, it very simply says, I can decode uh, these different fields. So one is a 16-bit field, the next is a 1-bit field, then a 4-bit field. And it will basically read all that in. And at the very end, you say, just put the rest of it into another binary stream. So keep that around, and we'll use that later. And what's interesting is this maps almost directly to the original specifications that are in RFC 1035 that describe a DNS packet. Right? I mean, almost exactly. This is really cool. So, um, so I took my ASCII art and my binary syntax, and I put the two together and said, wow, we have something really interesting here. Uh, if you actually look at this right now, you see that, that there, it has everything listed out, even down to the variable names, are almost exact, with slight difference because, the, for example, AN count is actually ANC, which is the answer count. Authority count is now AUC as opposed to NS count. Anyway, but the bottom line is they're basically mapped one to one. So that's the first really interesting feature. DNS is, is a, it's, it's a highly optimized binary protocol of messages. The idea was, what can we fit into this really small UDP packet and get a response back as fast as possible? All right, so it fits well. The second thing that's fantastic in Erlang, and as I started to explore more, I started to realize that when it comes to design of program flow and it comes to actually dealing with Lots of variety in the data that's coming in. So a data is some sort of piece of data that's structured similarly, but then is treated differently, like subsections of the data are going to be parsed out differently depending on the type of data. Well, pattern matching is a great match for that. So this is a little bit of code from the current. This, and all this I'm pulling is from an open source project. I'll give you the URL at the end called Earl DNS. So all the work, almost all the work that's being done here has all been open sourced. Uh, so you can see all the code later as well. So in this example, we see two functions that are essentially the same. They're eight, this, they take the same number of arguments. Uh, in this case, it's a list with four items in it. And it decides which function to execute based on, in this case, one of those fields. And it's, actually, it's the second field in that list. So the first one says, I have an A record. So the type comes in as a binary string in a record. And, and this is taking incoming JSON data that's a representation of the zone. And it's turning it into an in-memory structure that we can store and access quickly later on. And so it says, well, in the case of an A record, it's an IP address. So let me parse that out. Let me turn that, that binary into an actual, or like parse that address, which is a string. It's a binary. It's a bit string. And turn that into whatever Erlang's representation is of an IP address in memory. And then let me construct the, the rest of this, the record structure in memory. But if, on the other hand, it's a CNAME record, which is the second form, then that function will get invoked. And so essentially, when we're dealing with all these different record types, it's just a series of the same function with a slightly different signature uh, that's doing the pattern matching based on the type. And this is a really great way to sort of say, I have a, a list of transformations, or not a list of transformations, but I have a bunch of different data coming in, and I want to do different things based on some parts of the data. In Erlang, that's extremely easy. So this was a powerful feature of Erlang that sort of starts showing in the design of how Erlang applications work. The third piece, which was extremely interesting, and this one is, I think, ultimately the most important part of Erlang, is processes and OTP. OTP is the open telecom platform. But think of it basically as a, a way that describes how to build applications that can run in parallel. It's how to build a, it, it takes, and it, uh, it, it defines the generic part of a service, and you define the specific parts of the service. And as an example, or well, first let me talk about the flow of this. So every, every, essentially every service in OTP goes through these four steps. Essentially spawns a process. And when I talk process in this term, I mean processes in the Erlang VM. The Erlang VM can have lots of processes running in parallel. This is not OS processes. The Erlang VM takes care of spreading out these processes across the cores in your machine. So all you're dealing with is inside of the Erlang world, and it manages all of the, the, the process communication inside the VM and between those cores, and potentially distributed across many nodes, not just the local node, but across other nodes as well. It then initializes that process, and then it just sits there and receiving data, so receiving messages, essentially, until finally it exits out. So that's the standard life cycle of an OTP process. As an example, I wanted to show you the packet cache. So inside of a, an authoritative DNS server, you're going to get a lot of the same questions over and over and over again. And the response isn't going to change. So within, say, uh, you know, in our case, our packet cache has a 60-second time to live. 
Uh, it's configurable, but I'm, I'm going to stick with the 60 second one. But as in, within that 60 seconds, you may receive the same query over and over and over again. It doesn't make sense to go reprocess to get the answer again. We want to cache the entire question that came in and just give back a cached answer. So that's how the packet cache works. So here's a little bit of code. This is going to be the most complicated bit of code, and then I'll start talking a little bit about optimization, some of the things we had to do. So this is an example of a simple OTP process. Uh, a module just says, this is the namespace that I'm working in. All the modules inside of Erlang are flat. Uh, and then you have the behavior. And this is a generic server. This is basically just a generic process. It can respond to both synchronous and asynchronous messages. All right. Then we export the function calls that we want to make public. So these are the calls that you actually call on that module. The start link just says, hey, start up this process and have it running. Then we have some basic methods for getting, a pack, getting basically something out of the packet cache, putting something into the packet cache, sweeping it to clear all of the dead the packets that have gone beyond their TTL, and clearing out the packet cache completely to start fresh. Uh, the next section is the, the generic server implementation functions. These are not called externally. They're actually called by the OTP process when, it's, when you send it messages. And then finally, there's just some, some variables there and a, and a record that's defined that we're going to use to hold state. Now, the thing that's interesting about processes, if, if, for those of you who are familiar with object-oriented languages, in object-oriented languages, an object holds state, right? And when you want to act upon that state, you send messages to the object, typically by calling a method. Well, in Erlang, processes hold state. And you send messages to that process when you want to modify that state. All right? And process state is completely independent in almost every case from other process state. There are ways to get around this sometimes, but in almost every case, it's independent. Next bit of code. So back to the API. That's the API. Five functions that describes our packet cache. This is the implementations of the functions. We start up the link. Uh, when somebody tries to get a, something out of the packet as a question, we say, OK, generic server, call the get packet, send a get packet message with the question. When we want to put the question, we put the question and the response, and we say set the packet. It's very straightforward, in my, in my opinion. Now, the difference between call and cast is call is going to be synchronous, so it's going to wait for a response from the process, whereas the final two, sweep and clear, are going to be asynchronous. It's going to cast out that message and not wait for a response. Why? Because we don't really care about the sweeping and the, clean, the clearing to finish. We just want them to be done. All right, so it's, we, this mixes both synchronous and asynchronous calls in a single process. Uh, here's the initialization. So this has, uh, again, we see pattern matching here. There's two possible implementations for this function. One is you send no arguments in, in which case it'll default to, say, at 20 I, I said it was a 60 second, but right now we have it set to 20 here. Um, the, the other one says, I'm sending in a TTL and configuring it. And this is the part where it says, I'm going to have a timer. The timer is going to do various things. It's going to sweep in this case. And then I'm going to set my, my default state. So I'm going to start with a state that keeps a reference to the timer and also the TTL. And that state, every time one of those caster calls come through, it's going to actually give me that state at that moment as part of the function implementation. We'll see that here in just a second. So here's the handle call for the get packet. It says, uh, I'm getting the state. You see the third argument in that function call is the state. So that's the current state in that process, uh, which is basically just a, a, a hash, like a map of data. Uh, and then it tries to look up inside of ETS. ETS is, a, a, is a, basically an a, a in-memory data store. It's like it's basically an in-memory hash map is what it is, right? But it's really fast, optimized to be quite fast for certain types of things. Um, small data sets, or actually pretty large, too. I don't know. I'll look down around here. Anyway, the point is that it looks into, it looks into ETS. It says it tries to find something. If it finds a question that matches, cool. Then it will check the expiration date. If, the, if we hit the cache but it's expired, all right, then we'll send back that message that the cache is expired. And the, the caller knows what to do in that case. It says, oh, I'll just continue on into, the, into resolving that record. Um, if the, ca the packet is good, then we'll go ahead and reset the timer on it so the packet will stay around a little bit longer and we'll return back the response. Um, actually, in this case, we don't reset it, but we could have done that. And then the final one is, is there was a cache miss, and it sends back that cache miss. And again, the caller knows what to do in this case. The caller says, OK, I just need to go through the resolution. Uh, this is for getting the packet. Same thing. It basically, it, or sorry, this is for setting the packet. And it inserts the packet into ETS with the, the current timestamp. And, the, and with the TTL added onto it. Uh, this sweeps the packet cache. 
the first function. And that will actually, it, it does a little bit of, of lookup in ETS to try to find all of the packets that are expired. And then it will delete them from the data structure. And then the final one is clear, which basically says just remove all objects that are part of this packet cache. So that's an, that process is running inside the Erlang VM, completely independent from all the other processes. And Erlang handles the responsibility for managing the, that process. To, and if there are any errors, to handling the failure of it and restarting the process, or the, the exiting of the process, things like that. Which is really powerful, because we don't have to manage any of that. We just have to follow the OTP principles. And we have this completely independent process with its own memory space. It's really powerful, in my opinion. So what are some of the challenges, though, if you're going to be working in Erlang. That was, uh, the initial thing was great. I found these things that work, um, but now we talk about what are the things that are difficult when you're working with Erlang. Example, the first one, and this is when you start with the language, it's just thinking in terms of Erlang. It's thinking in terms of functions and processes. And if you come from a language where you're, you have object-oriented syntax or you have procedural syntax, it's going to be strange that you always have to pass the state through a function. You, there's no shared state anywhere. All right. So when you call a function, you need to get it, give it everything that it's going to work with. And it will give you everything back that's the resulting transformation of, of whatever the end result was of its calculation. Um, and transforming data versus updating data is hard to get used to at first. But that's a beginner's problem. That's the problem that once you pass that and you learn that processes are essentially the way that Erlang can deal with state that lives a long period of time, and then functions are designed to just do the processing without having any shared state, then it starts to make sense. So you get past the, 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 the early challenge and go to the later challenge. So the next question is, how do you operate an Erlang system? The reason, being, the reason that becomes a challenge is because Erlang systems are essentially their, this entire OS for applications that sits on top of your existing operating system. And it has an entire tool set that it, that's designed to work with it explicitly. The, and it doesn't necessarily work with the standard tools like top that you might be used to in, say, a Unix environment. And so for example, when they switched from R14 to R15, which is the release version of Erlang, there was a lot of confusion because the CPUs were always running. And people were like, what's going on here? This thing's using up on my CPU. Well, no, the VM was was staying hot because it actually turns out it takes more time to spin up something to process rather than just to keep it warm for a little longer waiting for the next message. But it, got a lot, it created a lot of confusion. Some great articles out there about this. But this, it requires a completely different mindset to operate in our Lang system. So that was a significant challenge. And finally, you have to learn to work around what Erlang isn't good at. So in our case, and, and your mileage may vary on this, in our case and our needs, we found that it was not suited to work on large, amount, large amounts of text data or data that needed to become text data. Um, and it was also not designed to uh, produce large amounts of structured data, at least in our case. And, and, and I'll get more into this in just a second. But that, that was sort of some of the things that we had to work around. So once we got this system working, at the most basic levels, so this is running locally on machines and running a few test environments, uh, we st I, essentially we started dealing with the performance of it. In an in authoritative DNS server, the idea is to have low latency. All right? The idea is to have the, the, the packet, the time from the packet coming in and to a response going back to the customer, you want to get that as low as possible. And there's a lot of factors. There's network, there's, there's actually CPU pro in our case. There's all kinds of these different factors. Uh, so these are, I'm just going to give you a few of the things that, that the performance tuning that we did. And when I say we, I wasn't alone on this. Darren helped me out a lot on this as well. But it, it, it's, these are a few of the things that we had to do. The first thing was to actually identify those bottlenecks. And to do that, we used two methods. The first was looking from the outside in. So the, in the, remember I mentioned that the problem with authoritative DNS servers is all of the edge cases? Well, the first thing that I had to do was, was come to have a decent test suite they could show all of these edge cases. Fortunately, the folks at PowerDNS had already built this. All right? So I took their test suite and started running a variation of their test suite, because I re-implemented it so that it was easier for me to mutate a little bit, because we had additional tests we not wanted to add on top of it. And their test suite was a bunch of folders with shell scripts inside of them. So I essentially took that and defined an Erlang test suite that would sit and query our name servers. Well, once we got the correctness right, and that took a while, 
then we started going, well, what if we actually start timing all of these queries as they appear from the outside, just running in a local environment, you know, one times two, three times two, basically to be able to do some sampling on it. And really quickly, we found that, okay, there are some issues here where it will take, say, you know, hundreds of milliseconds for a response to come back. Well, this is a problem. All right, we want to come back. We don't want the app to be the source of the latency. We want the latency to be at the network level because that we can optimize uh, even more with different network strategies. So the other thing we measured then was inside. So if we have the outside here that's measuring the questions coming in and the response times come back. Then we also started looking for hotspots inside of the application, started measuring there. Once we started figuring out where it was, it became obvious. Andal's law okay, is in full force here. Essentially saying the speed up of a program using multiple processors and parallel computing is limited by the time needed for the sequential fraction of the program to execute. All right? And in our case, at the time of when I started building this, the sequential portion, we had to figure out where it was and push as, like basically try to get everything out of that so that was responding in the shortest time possible. You want to minimize the amount of time spent in that single process. And as soon as possible, hand off the request to a, a process that can operate in parallel fashion. Now, the thing that's interesting is you have to actually be aware that the handoff becomes a factor in the performance. And in fact, at very small times, the actual timing of the handoff becomes a factor in the performance. So all these things play into sort of optimizing this system for best performance. Uh, the final thing was garbage collection. It's pretty good in Erlang but it can still be an issue. So if you're creating processes and then throwing them away, it's a lot of waste. And the garbage collector will eventually come in and it will start causing problems. Uh, so the, that became a factor as well in the optimization. So where do we end up once we started to realize what these different elements were to optimize? Um, so the, the single process is reading the packet out of the UDP uh, port, basically. So prior to Linux 3.9, uh, only a single process could read from a particular UDP port. So that was our, that was our bottleneck right there. Uh, so initially we measured from the outside and then we measured from the inside and actually timed the amount of uh, time it took. And it, and it wasn't like we just immediately knew that. I essentially started working down from the outside in, so from the resolving. Okay, well the resolving's slow, but all the different pieces of the resolving aren't necessarily slow, so there's something else in it. So I started working basically down uh, this, the stack until we got down to this tight loop. Uh, the initial implementation had all of the processing on that tight loop. Well, that's no, that's no good, right? Because essentially you're talking about a single thread dealing or a single process all the way through the, the request. So you're extremely limited. If a process is going to take you know, 30 to 250 milliseconds, then you're, you're talking about being able to respond to four queries per second. This is no good in, in, in DNS land. All right, so the next thing was to move to a pool of processes that we can hand off to. And the first implementation we used was Poolboy. Poolboy is sort of kind of a standard pooling implementation, and it's good. But when we came down to measuring it, we found that just handing off to Poolboy was taking four milliseconds. All right, so now, I mean, that implementation already had a huge speed up. We went from four requests per second to, uh, to what, like 250 requests per second. Okay, this is a good jump, but it's still not good enough. I had set a goal, and I said the goal was at least 1,000 requests per second, right? So I want a millisecond or sub-millisecond response time, like times for doing this handoff. So the final thing that we ended up on was this, using, basically using an, a queue structure that's already inside of Erlang to hand off workers. And this queue has, has a limited size, which is construct, which defined basically in the beginning. This is the implementation of handling a request as it is today. Essentially, we pull a worker out of the queue from this collection of workers that we have, um, and then we attempt to cast. So again, remember that's an asynchronous call. The worker is an independent process. We don't care if it returns because the worker is going to have a reference to the UDP, like to the UDP address that sent the question. So we can just respond back by sending a message back to it. If the queue is empty, then we just drop the packet. All right, so this is like, this is, we're going to keep running, but we'll start failing by dropping packets. That was, that was the first implementation. And the current implementation, actually, and it works pretty well for the size of data that's going through here now. This is the actual part that calls that, and as it is today. So essentially, every time a UDP packet comes in, uh, we're using Folsom now to measure how long it takes to hand that packet off. The 
the request is essentially sent through the handle request function with the socket, the host, the port, the binary data, and the current state. And then we're using active once, so every time that we get a question, we then turn the socket back to active once. It's basically, it means we control the flow of packets into the system. We don't let the OS really control the flow of packets, right? We're, we're controlling it just for that one request, and we keep doing that every time. So this is, it's gonna be a little tough to see this, I know, I'll give you the numbers. Essentially, what we finally end up with, and this is on the operational system right now, the, the 99th percentile for handing off these packets is anywhere from 35 to 60 microseconds. All right, so this is a huge improvement over what we were dealing with originally, giving us the ability for one node in our network to handle 17 to 25,000 requests per second. All right, way above and beyond the thousand requests per second that we originally, that I was, my goal was. So I was like, this is great, so we're on the right path. Because we have, in our Anycast network, 40 nodes right now, meaning that we can handle anywhere from, say, 650,000 to over a million questions per second. Okay, this is good. For our particular needs, this is great. We handle, we do domain resolution for probably about 60,000 zones in total. We're not anywhere near that yet on our Anycast network, but the point is, is that we think that we can handle it. Um, so a little bit more about that process pool. So like I said, the number of, of uh, workers is configured externally. We can set it right now. It's a relatively low number, but we can increase as we need to. Um, it, we don't ever increase or decrease the size of the pool. It's fixed so that we know that there's a fixed value. If we wanted to decrease or increase it, we'd have to reconfigure and restart. Um, and the assumption is, is that all of those workers that are available in the queue will finish before it hits the end of the queue. If not, we just drop the packet. Uh, another thing that we ended up doing is initially we had a backend database similar to how PowerDNS worked. We were talking directly to a MySQL database and then later a Postgres database. And ultimately what we decided was we need to bring all the zone data in memory. All right, memory is cheap. We've got to be able to bring the stuff into memory. And that way we remove all of the overhead required to call out to a database to determine if a record even exists. Uh, so now we do an in-memory cache. Um, and of course, that presents its own set of problems, which is probably worth an entire another talk, which is how hard caching is. All right, somebody at this conference has to talk about this. So caching's really hard. It's really hard to get right. But it's one of those things that you pay, that you, sometimes you need. And in this case, we're willing to pay the price for that. We do remote zone loading from a special purpose server. Remember back when I said that one of the problems with Erlang that we had to work around was some of its text processing and the ability to generate large amounts of structured data? Well, the initial implementation of Erlang was relatively slow. It took a long time to generate our entire zone data into a structure that could be passed over the network. Well, we ended up switching to Go in that particular case. So the zone server is written in Go, and the reason we chose Go is because it's awesome for doing that particular thing. It's resource, the, the basically its use of memory and CPU is amazing, and it's, it's optimized for, for, essentially it's optimized for web services, right? And that's a lot about Par parsing text data and pushing text data back out. So in this particular case, we let Golang handle the production of that zone data in a format that Erlang is ready to handle. And that way, all we have to do is basically parse that JSON at startup time and bring it all into memory. And then we have other processes that are used to update it with only small zone changes. We do basically do just, hey, I'm going to update this particular zone. Uh, for performance, at this point, initially we were using the timer module manually. Now we've moved to Fulsome for everything, which is a really awesome uh, tool for measuring all kinds of performance. It does metrics for, for counters. It does, um, it does hist histograms. It does all kinds of really neat things. Just stores the data, and then we push that into an external service, Librato, where we can create graphs like the one I showed before. That's really important as we go forward and we start to identify new bottlenecks. Um, so where are we headed with this? Well, now in, in Linux, you can use SO reuse port. So this potentially is, you, uh, it allows us to have multiple processes that are actually pulling from the same UDP port. Um, so that potentially allows us, let's say we have four processes, now we can do four times on any one of those particular nodes. We don't need it yet, but it's there now, and that would be the next step to go to. Uh, it's not on all OSs though, which is part of what makes the challenge, but in our case, where we have a homogeneous environment, or at least we can guarantee that we have that, it's a lot easier for us to use things like SO uh, reuse port. More metrics, we have to identify the high latency paths and optimize those. Um, and then one of our big bottlenecks right now is startup on the Erlang side. When we, when we load the zones for all of our zones into, the, into memory, it takes about a minute and a half to warm that entire cache. 
That can be made parallel as well, though. And all this, I mean, essentially, when you're building systems now, all you, you start thinking about how can I make something parallel, right? So that can be parallelized by having different processes look at different chunks of the zone file and then combine them back together at the very end once they've done their, their CPU intensive or memory intensive processing. And then the final thing is command and control tools. Uh, some of that's going to be using Erlang itself. There's a lot of command and control, like, there's a lot of ways basically where you can, you can hook into a node and start like calling, it's basically like a REPL, right? You can actually connect to a live system. But what's interesting is because supposedly, this is the theory, right? We haven't put this in play yet, but you can actually run a node locally, work with the REPL there, and send messages to other nodes that are distributed across other systems. So that's kind of one of the tools. The other is I'm a big fan of having sort of HTTP tools, right? Because HTTP is a protocol that we can easily uh, get into. We can have other languages that are connecting to it and talking and, and sort of taking data down, statistics or uh, zone data, and looking into what the live system looks like, and then comparing that across all of the, the nodes and determining, is a node not updating properly? Um, there's, we could take this all kinds of other steps further, too. The, as we heard from the previous talk, React does an amazing job as doing that across a whole bunch of nodes as well, so that's another option as well. So ultimately, we had to find Erlang's sweet spot. That's what this came down to. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, we found it. And the Erlang sweet spot is processes that are systems that are going to run, that need to run for a long period of time, um, and that need to, if, if they're going to fail, they're going to fail fast, allow you to fix what's failing, and then otherwise, they're just going to run nonstop. And they're going to run and allow us to have built-in parallel processing as part of the language and the, the libraries. So all this is an important part of why we ch ultimately chose Erlang. And the decision has been a good one. It's the, not without challenges. But at the same time, Erlang has a lot of properties that we found that make some of this stuff really a lot easier for us. All right, and that's it for now. I want Before I end and go into questions, I'd like to, to mention, um, I don't have them with me right now. But if you catch me later today, I brought some, um, some nougat. From I, I live in France, and I brought some nougat from France that's from a, made in a village right near where I live. And as long as you're not allergic to peanuts, honey, or eggs, then they're awesome. So uh, find me later uh, if you're interested. And I, I have a, a few bags of it. They're, they're very good. They're, they're excellent. So um, with that, I'm going to go into questions. Question down front. Sure. So the question is, what other languages do we evaluate to, to build this in? Um, as I mentioned before, Lua inside of PowerDNS was one of the ones that we, and I thought it was, it was very promising. It looked like Lua was going to be a good solution. But the libraries for doing DNS resolution, which is an important part of how our alias record works, just weren't working. And so we were spending a lot of time just trying to, to recompile things to get it to work. And it just, it, it, basically, we got into a situation where it was like, OK, we're spending too much time. We're not making headway. And it's no fun. And one of the things that's beautiful about running your own company is you can focus on doing the stuff that you actually have fun at. All right? And so that was, this is one of the impetuses, right? Let's do something that's fun. Uh, obviously, we looked at a lot, uh, some of the other off-the-shelf stuff that we could have looked at. There's some other C stuff out there that looked at a little bit. Part of what we wanted there was the ability to, to keep building the system over time. We wanted something that was, that was malleable, that we, could, um, that we could add new features to and actually enjoy it. And one of the other benefits, which I didn't talk about, which I, but which I found, is I think Erlang is a really good language for adding new, new things on top of existing apps. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that it supports, both as a language, such as hot code, code swapping, not that we necessarily use it, but it's there as an option. But it's also, it's just, it's easy to reason about how the system operates because you have this clear separation between immutable data, functions that process immutable data, and your state, which is all inside of processes. OK, so that was another one. Go wasn't at the point where there were DNS libraries at the time. They are now. And in fact, we use Go for other things where we're looking for um, low memory and low CPU usage, so really highly optimized resource usage. Because Erlang, kind of like the Java VM, takes up a lot of memory and CPU. All right, it's designed to do that because it takes everything over. And so um, Go is a case where it's the exact opposite. Go does not take over anything. It compiles compiles down to like the the, the smallest thing it can. 
the dependencies, it minimizes dependencies. You can't define dependencies that you don't actually use in Go. And so therefore, there are these properties of Go that we find really useful for certain classes of problems. Um, so that's something I learned. Yes, question in the back. Uh, have you guys looked at using like DFRAM or DPTK or like previously Have we looked at using P, what, is it, what are the names? The answer would be no, because I can't even, I don't remember the names or something. <laughs> Uh, okay, so have we looked at things that would cut the kernel out? Uh, not really, not yet, no. I, I'm not sure it would be, I'm not sure what the challenges from doing that inside of Erlang would be. Uh, you know, it's, that we probably have to fall down to C, like get down to C at that point. And um, I'm just not a C programmer. And so the fact of the matter is, is that when I, I can read it, but the amount of time I would put into making it work right and not like seg fault all over the place would probably exceed the amount of benefit that I would get from doing it, considering we're already processing you know, the, the tens of thousands to hundred thousands of queries per second. Um, sorry, there was another question here, and then I'll get to you over here in just one second. Yeah. So the question is, what was the process for rolling this out? Because it is a sort of a, a frightening process to, to move our customers over from something that's well established to something that's not so well established. Um, it happened to coincide with uh, a change in our network. We went from having a, a unicast network, which is where essentially there's a single node that can respond to a uh, to request to an IP address. We went from that to an anycast network where we can have nodes all over the world that basically broadcast the same IP address and it's up to the routing protocol to decide which one it goes to. And so it just so happened that we had this fresh environment to work with where we could slowly move customers over into it. Um, we actually did try to roll out on our unicast network early on and this was before I had put the test suite in place and, uh, but we only rolled out, yeah, this external test suite for the, this, I know Darren, Darren's like, I'm cringing here. This is the realities of doing business though, right? So we, but we didn't roll out to everything. We rolled it out to just one server, which meant that the majority of people still got good answers. <laughs> <laughs> but some people in edge cases were not. And as soon as we started getting complaints, we're like, okay, roll it back. Let's start looking at it again. And we, we tried that a few times. And ultimately, the Anycast network would let us have a free space to work in so we could start smaller and grow it back out, um, which is why we're still running two parallel networks. We have the Unicast, which is still running PowerDNS, and the Anycast, which is running this new system as well. You had a question over here. Right, okay, so the question is, how did the old system perform uh, compared to the new system? How many requests per second? And was there a perceived uh, result to the end user? Um, so the answer is that the PowerDNS for all queries that, are that you can respond to by a database query. So basically anything that's a simple response, it's very fast for. So it was doing thousands of requests per second um, without any trouble, all right? Like it, it, the, the usage wasn't significant. Uh, it wasn't that that was causing the problem. It was our customizations for non-standard records that was causing the problem. So when we switched over, the goal wasn't actually to have any perceived difference from the system. So we didn't want to make it faster. We just didn't want to make it slower. We didn't want to introduce new latency. We wanted to keep the levels at the same. And ultimately, we were able to do that. Then with the Anycast network, that's where we do the optimizations where the, the customers see a benefit because now they're route, they're, there's fewer hops to get to their name server. The name server responds in the same fashion, which is usually pretty fast, and then the, the data gets back. It's actually the latency between the resolver and the authoritative name server that's more of a problem. That represents the largest amount of latency, not the actual system right itself. Yes? It already is, yes. So, it, and I, I can't remember if it's under my name. So I'm A. Eden on GitHub, and the company is H. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's under Atron. Do we move the okay, so the test suite, Earl DNS is already under Atron. Atron is AE. In fact, let me move on to here just so you can see this. So that's the URL for the Earl DNS open source project. And then in that same repository, there's another open source project that's called like Earl Test or DNS Test or something like that. I can't remember what I called it. Um, and that's open source as well. And I attempt to, as the PowerDNS one develops, I attempt to develop ours in parallel. They're much further along with things like, um, like DNSSEC. So they have a whole bunch of tests that are around DNSSEC, which is basically allowing you to sign zones. We don't do any of that stuff yet. And so therefore, that, that part of the test suite is not implemented yet. But the basic parts of the test suite are implemented. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with that. Yes, you have a question. Do you have any unique challenges in scaling up, or is it just adding nodes? At this point, if you're on the Anycast, it's essentially adding nodes, which is the beauty of it. In the Unicast, we, we started hitting the, where we couldn't add more nodes because it was a single IP, like the single node behind that IP address. And that's why we said, ultimately, we had to move to Anycast. We had to, to do the capital investment to do so. Um, but right now, no, we can just add nodes on the Anycast network, is the, and that's the long-term goal. Um, I'm out of time. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>